Thank you for coming, everybody. This was quite a challenge to put together compared to the spring show where the flowers are sort of more individual. This is sort of everywhere there's color. So it was hard to um, pick things out. But thanks to a lot of the beautiful photos Jim took, uh, we do have some beautiful ones. So, okay, Jared, away we go with the next one. Um, for those of you who know my garden, it's, um, and I should qualify that, it's not just mine. I have a husband, Brian, sitting in the background, uh, and he's certainly a big part of it, especially since he retired. Um, but we have a half acre lot uh, in a neighborhood. It's sort of pie shaped, and it's on two distinct levels. There's the house level, and then down a big hill, we have the lower level. So we're going to switch around quite a bit because as we go through the seasons, um, we're not always on one level. So this is one of the beds at the side of the house. And for those who remember the spring show, the hellebores have finished and um, all the greenery is up. So this is quite colorful, uh, whether it's in flower or not. Oh, sorry, Jared, I'm clicking away here and nothing's happening. Uh, move. Uh, this is the same bed looking at it from the other side. Um, I like different colors and textures as you can probably see. Next slide. And we're looking at that bed, but from the road. So I have quite a lot of um, flagstone paths, which I've created over the years to make life easier for myself and less mowing for my husband. Yes. Next slide. <clears throat> so we're moving around to the side garden and we'll go past a beautiful rhododendron. Uh, next slide. Jared? Oh, uh, underneath the rhododendron, we have a maidenhair fern. This is one of my favorite plants, um, and I, I just can't get enough of them, so I keep splitting them and spreading them around. Next slide. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Anchianthus, but I finally found a spot where this particular little tree is happy. And here it is in bloom with a rather pretty blue hosta in front of it. Next slide. Uh, Dutsia is a Japanese um, small mounding shrub. I have, I started with one. I've probably got at least a dozen now. It's uh, one that's easy to propagate. Next slide. And here's an oak leaf hydrangea hiding part of a black bear, which came visiting one evening. And I took this through the window, so it's hardly a sterling slide, but I wasn't going to ask it to pose. So next slide. Uh, I primarily work with, uh, with perennials, but I do have a few barrels. And this is one that's by our seating area near the front door as is the next one, Jared. And I have a couple, but uh, literally by the side of the door. Um, they, they provide happy color. Uh, one of my favorite plants is the Amsonia, particularly at this time of the year. It's just a beautiful true blue. And I have several clumps of it now. Uh, it's one I leave up for winter interest, and it sort of is a pretty shade in the in the fall. Next slide. Here's a. This is what I mean about catching the garden and just finding one plant. There's so many that are just all bundled up together. So on to the next slide. Behind our gazebo, we have. Um, uh, a, a slew of azaleas. Here there's a two or three, or there's a couple of pinks, a peach and a yellow one, uh, plus a Van Hoot spir uh, spirea, which uh, they all bloom at the same time, which is particularly nice. Next one. Uh, there's one of the azaleas and the next slide shows you the, uh, just a branch of the spirea. 
on to the next slide. I have a clematis um, tower. I seem to be appalling at growing clematis, but this year or that particular year, this uh, one bloomed this very pretty pink. And the next slide shows you a blue. Uh, no idea which, which they are because they keep dying on me. So I keep having labels that don't match anything. So next slide. Yellow iris. I have a whole lot of the purpley blue iris, but I have to admit, I really like this yellow. Uh, I've pulled a lot of the purple iris out because I find it annoys me when it starts looking messy. And I reckon I don't need to, I don't have to mess around with it if I get rid of it. So next slide. Here's a clump of Ligularia dentata. It's, uh, I took this photo because I just love the green leaves. Um, this was growing in a shady area, which is no longer shady as of the fall last year when a row of trees was taken down. So we'll have to see if it likes the sun as much as it likes, excuse me, like the shade. So the next slide. Uh, this was an azalea that we rescued from a neighbor. Um, they were cutting everything down in the yard and uh, Brian spent several hours trying to fish the roots out from under a crab apple tree. Next slide. Walking past the azalea, the straight ahead is a, a giant fleece flower and beyond that is a vernal stream. Um, it's more a stormwater runoff actually, but we have a pipe that opens up by the shed and we get more water than we want when it rains heavily. Next slide. These are a row of black currants that are about to, well, they are fruiting. Um, they turn black before we can pick them, but um, they're very early. They leaf early, they bloom early, and they fruit early. So we're at getting to the end of May here. Into the next slide. Here's the giant fleece flower. Um, the first time I saw this, it was introduced to me as a hide your neighbor plant. Um, it's not really hiding anything for me, but it really, it's always absolutely covered with insects. So something likes it a lot. And we see it from the other side on the next slide. There we are. We're looking at it now from the far side. Um, <clears throat> our yard uh, garden backs up to the race school. And uh, there's a steep hill, just as there's a steep hill down from our house, from, from this stream, there's a steep hill up to the race school road. So anyone who wants to peek at the garden, all you've got to do is drive into the race school and it's just down the hill. So continue. Uh, this is a Regesia or Rogers flower. Uh, I'm plant I've planted these close to the stream in the hopes that I can, well, I can't, I can't really have a rain garden because when the storm drain empties, it would sweep everything that I planted along, it would sweep it away. So I have to stay a little back from the stream. But the Regesia, I love the leaf structure of this. Next slide. And this is probably our favorite tree. It's, uh, we parked it, planted it right next to our stone, uh, flagstone patio in the lower garden. It blooms early June and I just love the way it blooms. And you see the next bloom in the next slide. You see the bloom in the next slide. It's just unique. It's very, very different. Uh, it's also a native plant. Uh, this particular version of meadow rue appeared out of the blue. I seem to get a lot of plants um, that the birds bring in, and this has to be one of them. I have a lot of meadow rue, but this is the only one of this variety I have. On to the next slide. Um, I have quite a few spireas, and this is the ogon variety called mellow yellow. And it really does keep its yellow color for the entire year, um, turning more to mustard in November. And I, it 
basically doesn't lose its leaves till the snow falls. Next slide. Uh, we have a little hedge of shrub roses. It's a Teresa Bugnet uh, variety. We planted these when my second daughter was about three. She objected to her sister having peonies all her own and she wanted her plant. So these were planted in about 1978, I think. Mm -hmm. So next, I think that's, that's one of the roses. It blooms absolutely beautifully until the Japanese beetles land on the blooms sort of mid-July, and then that's pretty much it until September. So next slide. Ladies' mantle. I'm sure many of you are totally familiar with this. Uh, I've, I have to work quite hard to keep it in bounds. It has a habit of wanting to take over. Next slide, Dianthus. This is one of the uh, Dianthus variety. Uh, I know them as pinks. Um, we had a lot of these in England, so I was very familiar with them. Next slide, uh, Diablo nine bark. This is one of the Physocarpus native plants. Uh, it has these dark chocolatey leaves, uh, blooms with a white bloom, and then has red berries, and the birds seem to really like it. Uh, the next slide shows it cascading, so it's sort of a, a vase-shaped plant, and um, it does require some pruning to keep it in bounds, but I have many of them, and uh, it seems to be favored by the birds. So next slide. There's a salvia, next slide, and another spirea. I think this one is a little stiff uh, compared to um, the cascading Van Hoot, but it still is a pretty nice uh, bloom when it's, uh, when it's in bloom. Next slide. Ah, uh, the columbines. The next four slides or the next are all different columbines or some of the same ones. I have some that are even darker purple than this, but I'm afraid the photograph is in the dark, so you can't really see them. So I didn't bother with that slide. There's just a scrawny one there, but they, they just seed themselves all over the place. Next slide. Uh, this is uh, Brunera, that's the heart-shaped silvery green plant. It has a flower and it's already flowered um, like a forget-me-not, but it shows up nicely amongst all the different ground covers. Next slide. And who can not like Jack in the Pulpit? Uh, this is it in its sort of entirety, but then the next picture shows you one of its blooms. This has to be a Jim Block photo because it's just gorgeous. Um, the birds have carried these around the entire yard, so you never know where there's going to be a new one popping up, but I think they're spectacular. Next slide. This is Penstemon or Penstemon, as I tend to call it. Uh, it's the Husker Red variety. Um, it blooms for quite a long time, and then it produces the most gorgeous seed heads, which you'll see in a later slide. So next slide. This was obviously taken on a sunny day. Um, looking from the patio at, this, at the other side of the house, opposite to where the garden, side garden was, uh, we're looking down into the lower garden. So next slide. And if we take the path in front of the deck, it will take us down to steps, uh, down to the lower garden. And I think the next picture shows us at the bottom of those steps, yes. Um, the plants are growing up. There's iris, there's peonies, there's liatris, there's sweet williams, all kinds of things um, at the side of the steps. And then I think we have a few long views. This is looking towards the stone patio. Next slide. This is an area that was rather muddy and dark and dank a few years ago, and I decided I was going to pave it. 
uh, because it was impossible to mow and just sort of not very pleasant. And it's really been nice since. So it's like a, a secret um, path into who knows where. Next slide. Another border in bloom. There's quite a few of these, so you just have to flip through them, Jared. Uh, peonies, these were rescued, so I don't know what variety they are. Uh, next slide, same, same one, just uh, close up. These, I don't know the variety, but I do know that we purchased these and planted them in 1974, which was the year we moved into this house. Uh, there was absolutely not a flower in sight anywhere. And uh, the town had just planted a couple of little trees and we planted these at the foot of the tree along with a whole lot of bulbs. And uh, those are the ones that Julie considers hers. Uh, these are campanulas. Um, in, I know them as blue Canterbury bells or Canterbury bells, but Persificolia, I believe, is their Latin name. And here's a white variety, the Alba variety, which is actually really pretty. And this was a year when they threatened to overtake. They, they are actually a biennial. So every other year, there'll be a spectacular crop. And then the next year will just be okay. But this was one of the spectaculars. Stelladoro lilies, uh, Dora. I got rid of some because of deer damage, but these I try and remember to spray. And if I spray, I am likely to get a reasonable bloom. If I don't spray, we don't have any blooms, just pinched off stalks. Uh, here's an astilbe with some ladies' mantle behind it. Next slide, feverfew. A little um, out of focus, but uh, it's also a plant that threatens to take over. So I tend to dig a lot of it up and transplant it where it can do less harm. So um, this is Corydalis. I have a lot of pink Corydalis in the spring, which grows from a little bulb. Uh, this grows from seed and it reseeds itself all over. This was another common, commonly seen British plant. Um, the digitalis or foxglove. As kids, we used to wear those as little thimbles on our fingers. I love them. And we have a lot of them. We have quite a few in the garden, but there's a lot on the race school hill, which you'll see in the next picture. And also on the next one, they're just everywhere and they just keep blooming for what seems like weeks and weeks and weeks. Okay. And now we're looking further up. We're looking more from the top of the race school hill, looking down into the garden, past the bayberries, the hazelnuts, the um, whatever they're called, foxgloves uh, into the garden and keep going. Um, I don't have too many shots of what we're growing in the garden, but I do grow potatoes most years and there's my potato bins. Keep going. Uh, I have two or three mountain laurel and if the deer don't eat them, it, they're supposed to be deer resistant, but the, nobody told my deer that. Um, this is one in bud and the next one shows it in bloom. And then I also have a white one, which is in bud here. And I can't remember what the other one color is. Nor do I know what variety they are. It said C label. Well, there was no label, so that wasn't any help. Uh, this is a black lace elderberry. Um, it uh, doesn't spread like regular elderberry, so it's easier to keep in, in bounds. And it has a really pretty flower. Uh, it's actually pinker than it looks there. Uh, this is one of the other spirea. And um, I try and keep this by and large out of the garden because it spreads so much. But there is a lot of it around. And the next slide. Oh, we're now down to the dianthus again. After much hunting, we've come up with the conclusion that this is confetti, uh, deltoides. Um, it's... 
a low grow pops up everywhere. And then we get into Sweet Williams and more Sweet Williams. I think about the next six slides. For those of you who know me, you know Sweet Williams are something I can't get rid of. They just keep coming. Doesn't matter what I do. And they're biennial. People assume they just disappear, but mine don't disappear. And I love the color of this one. It's a real unusual shade. And that, there it is in a close-up. Um, but I do like them. The only problem with them is you do have to deadhead, the, deadhead them or they look pretty ugly. And there's some of the Campanula and the uh, um, Penstemon uh, growing back there. And lamb's ears. I have a lot of lamb's ears, which I use as a ground cover. They're the non-flowering version. They're the Helen von Stein version. And they, they sort of have big furry ears. And if you sit yourself down in the lower patio, you can get the long view towards um, the dip, which is uh, a, a town property adjacent to a yard on a garden on the north side. And here we've got another border in bloom. We're looking now towards the patio. And then for some unknown reason, uh, a common milkweed decided to plant itself right next to the deck. Uh, I assume it was brought by birds, but it's forming quite a big clump. And uh, we do get uh, monarchs and the caterpillars although it always seems the caterpillars disappear. So I, I suspect something eats them before they can pupate. Uh, next slide shows a rather prettier milkweed and uh, I'm not sure quite where that one went to. And here we have a border in bloom. We are getting into mid July. So it's summer, summer, summer. And the next slide. And, uh, probably the same border from a different angle. The netted thing behind are the blueberries and purple coneflower. Um, I'll talk about edging later. I see there's a question about edging and I know somebody asked about spraying. Uh, these purple cone, coneflower are loved by the goldfinches and we sit in the gazebo and watch the goldfinches descend on mass. Um, they're bald by September. Next slide. The bees like it too, apparently. Next slide. This is a fragrant azalea. It's right behind the gazebo. It doesn't flower till mid-July. And it is so fragrant. You just sit there with the scent wafting around you. It's beautiful. It's beginning to lose its flower there. And this is my favorite view of the lower garden. I love this. It's my screensaver shot. It's, uh, <laughs> I just like the way it looks. And uh, all these airy fairy things that are up in the air, you'll see in the next slide, which is semisifuga or snake root. And I think the next slide too, you see it beginning to open up. It's uh, like a bottle brush, but they are about six, seven, eight feet tall. Uh, I do have to stake them if we want to be able to walk down the path without having to fight them on the way. So next slide, this is a shot. So it's showing part of the um, stone patio down here. It also shows the uh, clematis tower without much in sign of a clematis on it. Next, uh, astilbe. Astilbe, I've got many, many, many astilbe. One of the things I found when I was um, building the stone patio was um, that the sand I uh, set the stones in, it was jock sand or a builder's sand, is an absolutely ideal environment for propagating seeds. And I must have dug up about 100 um, a stilby one year and transplanted them around the garden. They just seeded amongst the rocks. Um, there's a different one, sort of more a peachy pink. Uh, have a bunch of lilies. A few years ago, I was 
pulling them out like crazy because the lily beetle was driving me nuts. But some survived and we seem to have fewer li lily beetles at the moment. So I'm hopeful. There's the clematis tower. This time I've got some clematis on it. The orange thing is the lily. That's not a clematis. It's the, and the next shot shows you that particular clematis. It's a rather pretty airy one. So my hope is every year they'll come back. Um, I do grow quite a lot of fruit. We have blueberries and summer raspberries and these gooseberries, very English, uh, keep us happy all winter. They go into the freezer and uh, I use them all winter. And uh, Next slide. And now if you want to sit yourself at the race school, there's a bench um, just down the hill from the, pair, from the road. You can sit on the bench and look across the sea of Menarda or Bee Balm and uh, study the garden. Brian and I sit on that and study our half acre periodically. Four o'clock in the afternoon, the sun shines right on it. Um, there's a single bee balm. I let it go wild on the uh, hill, but I do try and curtail it somewhat in the garden because it would take over otherwise. This is a lily growing amongst a bed of lavender. I've failed utterly at growing more lavender, but this particular clump um, is just enormous, so I don't really need more. So there's the lily close up. That must be another beautiful gym photo. Yes. Here's a Japanese painted fern and the bloom is from a little hosta below it. And that's the hosta bloom. A lot of my hosta I dug out and gave away because of deer damage. And I spray with liquid fence. Somebody had asked what I spray with. Um, here's an oak leaf hydrangea. I have three of them. They're called ruby slippers. And you'll see in a later slide why it's ruby slippers, but it starts out white. Um, there's our favorite sitting spot. So that's why we've got some annuals and this bed that's just a massive color. And next slide. There's that same bed again, a little later in the year. There's a lot more things blooming now. And these coral bells will have dozens of um, bees and hummingbirds at it, plus at the hummingbird feeder, but really at the coral bells is uh, ripe for hummingbirds. And the next slide shows the flower of that blue green plant over on the right. It's one of the low grow bleeding heart types. Yep. Uh, the side garden just looks lush at this time of the year. It's, uh, I decided not to label things. You have to come see it. So there's another angle and another angle, I think, beyond it. Uh, I think this purple thing, I'm not sure what that is. Is it status or is it, uh, I think it's uh, Bethany, or is that the right name for it? And uh, the um, spirea at the front is actually a gold charm spirea. There's a close up of that particular lily. Next slide. Astrantia, also known as masterwort. I was completely unfamiliar with this flower until about, I don't know, maybe eight, 10 years ago. Um, I have quite a lot of it now, plus a beautiful white one that Jim gave me, which was very welcome because it was a different color. This is uh, pinky and it goes quite a dark shade of purple as the year progresses. Uh, there's a close up of it. Here's another border in bloom. This ridiculous rose campion, which is the, the most garish pink you can imagine, but it pops up everywhere and how can you possibly get rid of it when it's so colorful and cheerful? We're mid-July, there's a birdhouse with one of our many nesting wrens that we're certainly not quiet in the garden. There's bird sound everywhere. Next slide. There's a black-eyed Susan, pretty colored one. Next one. Uh, Echinops or globe thistle. 
Uh, this is a uh, globe thistle in bud. And I, I think it's just architecturally beautiful. I love the shape of it. Uh, next one shows it in flower and the bees absolutely love this plant. It'll be absolutely covered with hovering bees. Uh, the next one shows them growing on the hill along with some tiger lilies. Next slide. And the tiger lilies seem to have traveled. Um, I don't know where they came from originally. Uh, I have a lot in the lower garden, but I now have a big batch in the front garden bed and uh, they're rather colorful. So that's the view from the street. And then if we're sitting in our chair, there's the view from the house. So we have to peer around them to see our neighbors walking past with the dogs, et cetera, as a close up. They actually, they only bloom for about a day, but they, they do bloom for quite a long time. Um, because I grow some tubs with annuals in them, I often have leftover annuals and I tend to park them here. This is a bed that's absolutely full of bulbs in the spring. So I don't grow too many perennials because it's just too hard to dig into the ground without digging up all the bulbs. Um, I got a bunch of leftover uh, geraniums there, which I'd wintered over. Continue. Uh, Japanese anemones or windflower. This is one in bud. And I see there's a um, jack in the pulpit, sort of in the bottom left corner that popped out of nowhere. And the next picture shows it in bloom. Um, these stand so tall, we actually can see them through the window. They, they sort of peer at us through the uh, front windows. Um, I have some growing amongst a witch hazel and it looks like the witch hazel is blooming because um, they grow up so tall and sort of peek out through the branches. Next one. Uh, this is my favorite view from the um, gazebo. Just stop for a moment, Jared. I'll answer that question about the... Um, uh, <clears throat> the wind flowers, the Japanese anemones, uh, I would say they're invasive. I tried to dig them out of that particular bed one year, and I swear I took every cup of soil out of the entire thing and sifted it. And the following year, you would not have known I'd done anything. There was just as many. So now I kind of think, okay, uh, it's edged by big stones. So it's, there's a limit to how far they can go, but I just pull them out when I don't, if they're in a place, I don't want them. But yes, I would say they're somewhat invasive. Um, so you're looking at this through the net, through the screen, the, the gazebo screen, but Brian and I sit there and watch the birds and the bees and get a nice cool breeze on a nice cool day or a nice hot day, I should say. Um, okay, next one. Uh, Lobelia cardinalis. I missed an eye there. This is cardinal flower, um, loved by the hummingbirds. Here it's growing at the foot of the raspberries. Um, I do have to spray this if I don't want it to get uh, eaten by deer. Um, we get a lot of deer. So next one. This is that purpley blue thing, which is actually new to me, but I seem to have quite a lot of it now. So I'm not quite sure where this came from either. Um, I looked it up and it was called betony, but you maybe know what it's called better than I do. <clears throat> so next slide, <clears throat> excuse me. I guess you'll recognize those, echinacea and a white phlox about to bloom. I would say that white phlox is invasive. I've spent years trying to eliminate it because it just was taking over, but it's still there. Next one. Um, I have a clump, big clump of hydrangea to one side of the gazebo, and I'm planting some red twig dogwood behind because we can see it from the house in the winter and we have some red twig dogwood elsewhere, but we can't see it very well from the house. So I wanted some I could see. I love the huge flowers on this. Um, 
again, the deer can eat all the flowers if I don't spray in the spring. <coughs> Next one, I think there's a close up of the flower. I love the blue greenness of this. Most of the hydrangea flowers go pinkish. This goes green. <coughs> Next one. A couple of, a few years ago, I saw this, uh, someone had a, an Aurelia cordata or Sun King Aurelia. Um, it's a shrub that dies back in the fall down to the ground. It just gets frosted in the late fall, but it regrows the following year. And it's now about six or seven years old and it's probably close to six foot tall. So it just booms up in the spring. And I have it in the side garden where it's pretty shady. So it's that splash of yellow, which I like. <clears throat> Next slide. This is the side garden and there's actually two of them um, with uh, limelight hydrangea in the distance. Next one. I also have quite a few of this golden tiara hosta, which is again, brings up that nice yellow in the shady area. <clears throat> the, sun, the sun shines into it in the uh, late afternoon, which is rather nice. Yes, and some ligularia with yellow blooms. <clears throat> A rather scrawny ligularia is the next one. I don't quite know. Look at it. It's a very feeble looking thing. It grows taller, but it's just not as dense. Next one. Um, this was actually taken probably three or four years ago, maybe as one Jim took, because it looks too nice to be one of mine. Um, but it's uh, looking into the side garden from a seating area we have, which is in the shadiest part of the lot. So late afternoon, if we don't want to be in the gazebo, we can sit right here and uh, just enjoy the cool. Next slide, there's the balloon flower, which is spectacular. We're getting into late August. Next one. There's a trillium seed head, lots of trillium, and the birds distribute them liberally around the yard. Next one. Uh, I have a couple of stephanandra. Uh, it's a mounding shrub that attaches itself to the ground. So it's easy to reproduce and I'm um, using some on the hill. Uh, I, I really like the, the color of it and the way it grows. Next one. Have a lot of liatris, which I grow from the seeds every year, I grow a few more. So the next one. So I have lots of clumps of this around the uh, garden. Next one, there's a white version. Uh, question about whether we're moist. The upper garden is like everybody else's. The lower garden is right at the water level because, you know, the groundwater level. So that is moist. Uh, here you see some meadow rue. We're reaching to the sky. It grows, I don't know, 10 feet tall stands up all by itself. And the next pictures show it in, I think the next pictures show it in bloom. It's the um, Chinese meadow rue. This is lavender mist. Uh, it pretty much stays upright unless a horde of birds decides to land on the top of one of them. And you'll see kind of bow under the weight of the birds and then it'll usually bounce back up. But it's a very pretty plant and I virtually have a hedgerow of it. And that reseeds readily. It looks rather like aquilegia leaves, columbine leaves in the spring. So I'm always reluctant to pull anything out that looks like meadow rue or aquilegia. Yes. Again, summer blooms. You can see the height of the, uh, med uh, of the uh, whatever it's called, the meadow rue. Yes. This is one of the uh, lilies that survived my purge growing among some uh, Shasta daisies. Yes. And there's one of the lilies. I don't, I'm not sure if it's the same one. And poppies. I seem to have these annual poppies that pop up all over the place. Um, they don't grow like the others. 
you know, the orange ones, uh, but they are very colorful and they produce a lot of seeds. So they do self sow. And here's um, some sunflowers and some of the cardinalis growing behind the electric fence. Um, I, I left those because I could, um, but also it saves me from having to protect them from the deer. So the next, the cardinal flare is just really colorful and the hummingbirds love it. Yeah. Uh, this is another shot in the garden. Uh, the back is uh, uh, scarlet runner beans. And the left is a tithonia or the Mexican sunflower, which is a huge insect attractant. And then there are some, um, whatever those are, uh, marigolds at the front. And just a quick run through, uh, just to show that I'm not all beauty. We do actually grow some food. Here's some sun gold tomatoes, uh, green zebra. And a couple of weeks later, they are more than ripe, ready for picking. I grow a lot of Roma because I can toss them straight in the freezer and work on them in the late fall when I'm done with the garden. Uh, here's a red variety, and I can't remember which one it was with the red ones a few days later. And this was one of Jim's early morning photos of the deer on the race school hill. Uh, they've probably been visiting. I did a walk around the garden the other day when there was no snow on the ground, and there's a lot of deer poop, so I know they've been. Next one. Uh, here's another of the tubs. Uh, I perk up the corner of the garage with a few annuals. And we've got the most beautiful clump of zebra grass. And it's literally been standing tall all winter. It's just been spectacular. There's another grass next to it, which is somewhat less spectacular, but still rather nice. But that got uh, knocked over early in the year by the snow whereas the other one survived. Uh, this is a picture of a Japanese, of a Japanese tree lilac. Um, I don't seem to have one of it or a decent one of it in bloom, but I absolutely love these seed heads, although I swear that every single one would produce a tree left to its own devices. But they're, they're translucent with the sun shining on them. They're just really fascinating to watch. We sit in the gazebo and watch the birds amongst them. Yep. Um, we had the only, the only stonework that we didn't do ourselves were these steps. Uh, we did have these put in uh, about, I don't know, 12 years ago or so. Um, so we have a rock garden that's adjacent to the house and then the big hill on the left. And there's the oak leaf hydrangea to living up to its ruby slippers name. Uh, back in the lower patio, the woolly thyme has taken off amongst the stones. And I also have a very low grow sedum whose name I don't know. Um, this uh, on the right is a, a summer sweet. It's Clathra alnifolia, another native. Uh, behind it is one that you'll see a close-up of the flower in the next picture, um, the ruby spice. I think I've got three or four big ones that kind of flower over about a month and a half. And then I have quite a lot of the hummingbird uh, variety, which are a lower grow um, summer sweet. Yes. Another border still blooming. We're mid-August now, so things are getting, I'm beginning to start feeling like I want to start cutting things down. Um, again, another border. Uh, this is that clump of Ligularia dentata. The shade is gone, but the blooms are out. The row of trees that, there was a row of um, Arbor that have been taken down. They're about 50 years old and were not in great shape. Uh, but we're going to have to figure out what we're going to do along this edge because it's uh, 
a lot sunnier than it used to be. And here's the bloom. Uh, it's a nice bright yellow. It sort of is a cheery bloom. And the next one, I have quite a bit of monk's hood, which is actually very poisonous, but so far we've managed to not kill off our neighbors. But, um, and these are the seed heads of the Astrantia or Masterwort. And here's a great blue lobelia. Um, unlike the Cardinalis lobelia, this one tends to be a, a sort of, it uh, lays itself down all over the place. Um, but it's a pretty blue and it's late August flowering, which it is not so bad. Uh, here I've got a lot of sedum. We'll see some autumn joy sedum later, but this is a variety that's more a trailing kind. It's got purple um, stems and leaves, and it kind of the flowers always appear miles from the actual root. So we'll see a few of these. Uh, it's, it, we have a, quite a lot on the rock garden um, adjacent to the steps. <laughs> Oh, excuse me. <laughs> Sorry, what happened? Are you there, Jason? Uh, Jared? Uh, What's happened? I don't know. I don't know what to do. Go back to Zoom. You should be good to go. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Stupid daughter. Um, specifically told not to call me in the middle of this time. Okay, so anyway, these appear uh, quite frequently. So you'll see them, and I'll be, there's one or two shots of it. So you can just skip, uh, move through these, Jared. Just to say that, and the um, cor cor uh, Corridalis pops up all over the place too. Nice little mossy patch. Oh, this is uh, an area adjacent to our lot. We are, we have the school behind us. Uh, yes, the school behind us, the race school behind us, and we have a town lot, a small pocket park at the side. And this is what the kids refer to as the dip. There is a path from our neighborhood down the hill, across a bridge, on a path across another bridge and then up the far hill that takes them directly to the race school. It's absolutely gorgeous in the spring with all the um, um, primroses, primulas out. At the moment, it's just more a green leafy um, area. And the next one, Joe Pie Weed, lots of this, although I'm trying to limit it to just one clump. And the next one shows um, one of the monarchs. I have at least one photo with about seven monarchs on it, but it was a crappy photo, so I didn't show you that one. But they are present in abundance. Uh, this is one of the blue star junipers. At one point I had three of them, but the voles took out two one winter, which was very distressing. So every year I look to see if the voles have eaten away at the um, root structure. And the next one, uh, I have a lot of heuchera or it's a version of coral bells. Uh, this was probably started life as purple palace, but over the years it's um, seeded itself and it changes to different colors. And I rather like this uh, bronzy one. Yeah, uh, I have some hot lips turtle head, which as it doesn't bloom till September is a welcome sight. And the next one, uh, I thought I'd show you some of my asparagus ferns, the asparagus we ate back in the spring, but the ones I leave fern very vigorously. And uh, we have enough asparagus for the two of us for several weeks. Uh, here's some of the autumn joy sedum, and I do try and remember to pinch this back earlier in the summer, otherwise it gets too leggy, uh, particularly um, in the wetter areas of the low garden. But it's such a cheerful plant at the end of the year. 
And again, the butterflies and the bees just love it. It's a st stand of the zebra grass. Yes, Brian is telling me it's time to be finished. We're almost done. We're getting very close to the end. Keep going. We're at the end of September. Uh, here's the seed heads of the penstemon. Uh, these sprayed um, make the most beautiful Christmas decorations. They are well worth hanging on to. Yep, keep going. Uh, this is the end of the driveway, another annuals display, which is threatening to take over the lawn at the moment. And again, Montauk daisy. This doesn't bloom until October, so it tends to be a fight between the frost and and bloom time, but I have a couple of clumps. Uh, this heuchera I love because it's the color of my daughter's first car. My second daughter, it sort of reminds me of her. She painted a car that color. So um, I have a chocolate Joe pie weed, which starts out as sort of purpley bronze and ends up green with a rather pathetic flower, but it is liked by the uh, insects, so I leave it. And I think the next one is another Eupatorium. Uh, I know this is perennial ageratum, and that's it looks exactly like the annual, except bigger. And we're well into October, and it's just a mass of flowers. But this spreads. So it's, um, it's alongside the uh, race school uh, hill. I have a lot of winterberry, and this was a particularly good uh, fruiting year or berry year. And I think this is some of the bayberry that I planted on the race school hill. Um, again, the birds seem to like this and uh, it's like a little nature preserve, uh, the area on the hill. This is where the uh, monado was. There's Brian and I take it posing under our colorful hazelnut bushes. And some years we get a great crop of hazelnuts and some years the squirrels beat us to it. <clears throat> Keep going. Um, this was a shot of uh, one of the nine barks, uh, river birch, and I'd grown a castor bean plant, which we'll see in the next picture. Uh, absolutely enormous. It died with the frost. Um, these are raspberries and it's mid-October and we're still picking. The frost will kill them. Um, did we just miss one? Did you, can you go back one? Oh, okay. Okay, uh, next. next one, Jason. Uh, this is an interesting trunk. I thought there was a maple tree picture, but it, maybe it comes later. Um, I had to walk around, this was a photo Jim took, and I had to walk around the, the entire yard trying to find it because I couldn't, couldn't figure out where it was. Uh, it's a, it's a amur maple, I believe, and it's a gorgeous color in the fall, but keep going. Oh, I, either it's in the wrong place or we missed one. This is a froggy um, fountain that lives on the deck. Still blooming, we're into well into October, keep going. Uh, sunflower growing amongst uh, black-eyed Susan vine, and you can see the birds have already emptied most of it. Oh, here's the tree. Um, so we're in the dip now, but absolute mass of color. In the spring, it's a mass of color because of all the crab apples, and now it's a mass of color because of these maples. And the next one, oh, that was the one I was looking for. This is the one with the interesting trunk. Uh, it just is so colorful in the fall, it's gorgeous. Next one, we're almost done. Side garden, um, still colorful, late October, not so much flowers now, but colors of plants. And the next one shows my embarrassment of burning bush. I removed every burning bush in the property except for this row and Brian told me he'd divorce me if I took those out it separates us from the field which is a mass of little boys playing soccer and things so um, it is nice to have that uh, hedge uh, it turns a gorgeous color in the fall and the witch hazel beyond is gorgeous here I'm still picking the fall raspberries keep going 
Uh, we're into late October, peeking under our magnolia down into the lower garden. And the next one, the hydrangeas are a gorgeous color. Keep going. The front, the lilacs gone pretty bronze. We're still looking at a lot of color and keep going. And there's the oak leaf hydrangea. Now the leaves turn this wonderful uh, dark reddish purpley color. Yep, keep going. Uh, this is not a porcupine. This is <laughs> an opossum. Uh, I did change this, but unfortunately it wasn't changed on Jared's um, screen. So uh, my mistake, we'd had a porcupine visiting a few days earlier and, uh, but this is not dead, it's just sunbathing. It's a possum playing, possum. playing possum. Okay. <laughs> uh, looking uh, through the Ogon Spirea and the oak down into the lower garden. Yep. And I took a few photos late November. This is a, a Washington Hawthorne. And I took this and the next photo is totally covered in berries. That's totally covered in crab apples. And over the last few weeks, we've had flocks of robins and uh, cedar wax wings just about living in those trees. So they are just amazing. There's that zebra grass. And we're at the end of November. I think the next shots are, I cut back most of the plants in the upper garden because the bulbs, I don't wanna to have to deal with the, the plants around the bulbs. And here we are all cleared up for winter. The uh, epimidium will lose its stuff. Jim very nicely turned up on December 10th one year to take these photos of the garden with snow. Of course, we could look at this right now. And the next one, we're down to the last three pictures. So this is what it looks like. And then the last two are from the house. So this is what I'm actually looking at right now as I sit at the computer at, and I can watch the birds. And down in the bottom right-hand corner, we actually have a little heated pond. And I can't tell you how many birds and animals visit that little pond all winter. And then the last one is just looking from our living room down to the gazebo. So I sit in, the, in my chair and I plot what am I going to do next? So that's it, Jared, I'm done. Now I, I know there was at least one question about edging because I happened to catch it. Um, I, I gave up on that rubber edging and metal edging. And I just, every time I create a new bed, I dig a trench around the bed using the soil that I have dug up to raise the bed along with anything else on my compost and anything else. Uh, and then I fill the trench with whatever rocks, stones, etc., half bricks, pieces of concrete are available. Um, it gives me some drainage and a place to walk in the spring because the ground is very soft down there because of the wetness. So most of the lower beds are surrounded with about a, a nine inch trench. Susan, I'll, go, I'll go through the remaining questions in chat okay. in order. Some of them you might have already hit during your presentation, okay. so just let me know. Someone asks, how do you control the gold charm spirea? Ours is spreading out of control. Uh, I haven't had a problem with the golden one. If I do see a baby growing, I plant it uh, along the path in the race school. I made a mistake. It was actually the Japonica. Spirea that we have. Yeah. <laughs> that's the one. I can't, I can't, I can't dig. It's like crabgrass. It's growing underneath and out of the rocks. And I, I don't know how to get rid of it. Well, I don't know what to tell you. I, I've okay. kept every, <laughs> I, I got rid of it out of the garden, particularly on the hill, because I didn't want to have to deal with any on the hill. I want to keep off the hill. I'm not getting any younger. So, okay. So um, just keep digging it up and cutting it back and, um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I haven't had a problem with the gold. 
I no, no, no. I, I thought when I other one. saw that picture, I thought that's what it was. And then later on, you showed the, the yeah. uh, Japonica, and I, I thought, okay, that's what we have. And <laughs> it's yeah. awful. Uh, I, I yeah. was given one, and I have to admit, I've uh, there's several hedgerows um, along the paths in the dip um, because it, it helps – it helps protect areas and keep kids out of uh, some some vulnerable areas. So I sure. use it. I mean, if that. it was in the right spot, it would be yeah, okay. Exactly. It's just not. Yeah. So yeah. All right, I'll keep working at it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Next question. Molly says that her dianthus act like annuals. She's tried seven or eight times and they never come back. Do you have any ideas? But you mean the sweet Williams? I know, I don't know why people have such a problem. I can't tell you how many I've given away. Um, and I can't, I mean, literally, I have tried to eliminate them from certain areas because the, I don't like them. I mean, I love them in bloom. And if I leave them long enough, they're easy to deadhead. But I have to leave them until the, you know, the things dried out for it to be easy. Otherwise, I have to cut them off. And that becomes a pain in the neck. So I think less would be good, but it's not worked for me. There's always more. So, Robin would like to know what your favorite fertilizers are. I just use compost. Mm -hmm. I don't use anything else, really. I'm a real cheapie when it comes to um, spending money on things. So I do have a bag of ProGrow that I add when I plant something in the vegetable garden, but I've had it for several years. So it's not like I'm a heavy user, but I do make a lot of compost. Debbie is asking what you spray the lilies with. Um, liquid fence. Hmm. I buy a large bottle of concentrate and dilute it. I, I like that one because it doesn't clog up my sprayer. I've used different kinds in the past where I had to go inside and wash my sprayer out about between every plant practically. So that was driving me nuts. So liquid fence is the one I found useful. I'm sure so, there are others, but I like that one. Yes. Someone would like to know if you have anyone who helps you with all this gardening or are you able to do it all on your own? Um, well, Brian's sitting right behind me, so <laughs> <laughs> I have to say I have some help, but I don't think he would consider himself a gardener. He's very handy with big tools. Uh, in the past, we I had no, you know, heavy duty tools, but Brian, you don't have I use a rake. He uses a leaf blower. You know, it's like that. But um, yeah, he does help, and he helps a lot more than he used to. He used to like to just sit and look, but now he has more time. Pardon? You don't hire help. I don't hire help, right. Mm. right. Do the deer eat your winterberry? Someone would like to I know. They have so. difficulty keeping them away from theirs. Uh, as far as I know, they haven't. I, I bought a lot of my, uh, the some of the, I think the winterberry in the garden, I purchased as plants um, from a nursery. But I, I've also purchased a lot of the plants. So there's a lot of plants I haven't shown you, um, but viburnums and some uh, service berries, the bay berries, uh, a lot of winter berries um, I purchased from the uh, New Hampshire State Nursery and they sell them in bundles at 10 or 25 at a dollar each per plant. So, and I've been very successful with that spade in, rock it back and forth, stick the plant in, and then use my feet to close the hole. And if you plant at the right time, I don't even have to water beyond the first day. Someone would like to know with bird feeders so close to your house, how do you keep the rodents away? Bird feeders? You mean like rodents as in squirrels yeah. and voles and chipmunks? Um, we don't really. We just have to tolerate them. Poles. Someone would uh, like we have poles and we have baffles and mm -hmm. some of our bird feeders are on pulleys with baffles but we have a canny squirrel right now that could reach from the trunk <laughs> <laughs> sort of 
you know, one hand uh, to try and get the bird feeder close enough to get some seed. They really are quite fascinating, just very annoying and expensive too. I'd much rather feed the birds than the squirrels. But. Someone would like to know how far down you cut the zebra grass in spring. Uh, as far down as I can get it. And I was out the other day and I cut everything but the zebra grass down. I reckoned it was time. It was a nice warm day. I think it was Wednesday and I could walk on still frozen, somewhat less snowy ground and cut the plants down. And that's better than trying to do it when it's really soggy. And I have a lot of bulbs uh, down there too. So I, I need to get some of the plants cut down before um, they start coming up. Someone is asking if you can suggest plants to pair with the maiden hair. Not really. I, I just stick mine in wherever. Um, I don't know that I particularly tried to pair them. Um, I found a spot and dug a hole and planted them and I got quite a few from the garden club one year at one of our sales. Um, we hold the sale in May and the maidenhair fern in May looks like a mat of dead stuff and uh, nobody would buy them. So I came home with a whole lot of maidenhair fern and uh, was the beneficiary and have since taken them in potted and tried to persuade people that, you know, in a month, these will be absolutely gorgeous. But right now it looks like you're buying a dead thing. So it's always, it's, it's a hard sell in May. Somebody would like to know when you prune back your raspberry plants. We cut them down once we are either fed up of picking or, um, they're or they're done. Um, I mean, we really, for the last few years, we've not had a frost. We've actually pretty much picked until they're virtually all gone. <laughs> it's like, okay, I think we're done. And then we cut them down to the ground. And I usually apply another load of wood chips over the top. Um, we use a lot of wood chips. I get free wood chips and I use a lot of those. And we've had several people just commenting on how beautiful your gardens are. Well, thank you. Thank you. I love, as, as you know, I love it. And I love people to come see it. Uh, I usually have open gardens um, during the year. And all the way through COVID, there'd be people arriving fully masked, you know, and just sort of wandering around. Can we come and see the garden? It was nice to see people. And, you know, when you live in a neighborhood, we actually do see people. And I kind of love our little front seating spot because we can chat to our neighbors at the same time as uh, resting at the end of the day. So someone is now asking, Pardon? someone is now asking if you have a problem with bears being attracted to your berries. Um, we haven't, and they don't seem to, they've not bothered my compost either. So no, I, I mean, I always wonder if they will, but so far, no, I have, the blueberries, once the bees have done their thing, I cover them uh, and don't uncover them till I'm done. There was one year I didn't get them covered and I didn't have any blueberries. I mean, it was as simple as that. The birds and the chipmunks just, it was all gone. So, and last so year the squirrels ate the hazelnuts before they were even ripe. I mean, it was no point picking. It wasn't a case of trying to beat the squirrel. They weren't right, but they were in them anyway, which was a little annoying. Yes. That is all the questions in chat, but if anyone would like to unmute themselves and turn on their video to ask a question directly, you'd be welcome to do so at this point. I want to say hello to my friend Moira from Montreal. <laughs> Thank you for being here, Moira. Yes, anybody else? No, you're all very quiet. Well, it's lovely to see all those happy faces, uh, many of which I know. Um, and I, I hope you'll uh, come and visit. Uh, it's, we skipped right over spring. So there was an entire three months that I did last year. Uh, that, that's starting right now. The pink pussy willow is out and I've got one of the witch hazels is blooming. 
but I haven't found anything popping out of the ground yet. So, Susan, but it won't thank be long. you so much. Thank you for sharing your garden and your. Yeah. It's your my pleasure. And your time and your knowledge with us. And thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Well, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Susan. Well, Susan, it was fantastic. Your garden is to die for. <laughs> as always. <laughs> it is what it is. It's had 48 years of growth. So, yeah. Well, it's uh, beautiful. A lot of hard work. Year. And I love it. I mean, the mm -hmm. birds all winter keep me totally happy. So, mm -hmm. between the flowers and the year and then birds in the winter and a happy camper so okay well, thank, thank you, you everyone bye bye, bye. bye.